How would it affect your life if you began to see the world the way Jesus sees it? I mean, how do you see the world today? I, one of the things I love about Christ is, you know, he seemed to associate with everybody. Didn't matter who they were, whether it was a despised tax collector or the Roman governor, Jesus was there. He connected with the criminal and the synagogue leader, the fisherman and the king, the widow and the prophet, a rich man and a beggar. He connected with all kinds of people from every walk of life. We see it again and again and again, and regardless of how great or unknown they were, regardless of how rich or poor they were, or young or old or sinner or saint, Jesus cares equally for every single person on this earth. It's fair to say that people are what brought Christ to the earth in the first place. Um, we talked about that last week, and if you missed last week's message, I would encourage you to go online and check it out at seemorefirst.com. And this, by the way, is the last week you can do that. Because as of next Sunday, a new website will go live for the church. Go to thepoint.com, and seemorefirst.com will be no more. It's going to go away forever. So next Sunday, that's it. But right now, you can still go back and catch old messages, and we'll still have those available at our new website. But um, as you go back there and see where we talked about last week, we talked about the fact that Jesus cares for people. And the Bible tells us that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And then after he left, he left us with a mission to continue what he'd begun while he was here on planet Earth. And so the question here in week number two of this series is very simple for all of us to consider what's my part in Christ's mission. How, how do I participate in Christ's mission to reach the world? And so today we're going to start getting very specific. Last week we talked about how Jesus healed a demon-possessed man in uh, Mark chapter 5, and then he specifically told that man, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. We find story after story in the gospel of how people were impacted first in their own lives, and then the individual would spread the gospel to those who were in their circles of influence. When Jesus healed the politician's son over in John chapter 4, John said that he and his household believed, those that were close to him. When Jesus called Levi, who would later be called Matthew, the tax collector, to be his disciple, Mark recalled over in Mark chapter 2 that while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Some of Matthew's closest associates, the people that were his friends, the people that were his colleagues, they began to follow along and they came to know Christ as well. They were his friends. The, these were the people that knew him the best, that were in relationship with him. These were the people that Matthew cared for. Now, if you truly care for someone, don't you think it's going to be important to help connect them to the incredible message of God's love? I mean, if God has impacted your life on some tangible level, don't you think that the natural thing is we're going to want to share that love with somebody that we care about or somebody that we know? I mean, so many less significant things happen. I mean, we find out there's a new restaurant, and we're telling the people we care about, or we find out there's a big sale someplace, and we're telling the people that we care about. When we've been impacted by the love and the grace and the mercy of God, we want to share that with others. And the reality is that if Christ's mission here on earth was to seek and to save the lost, and then he's called us to continue what he began, the question we need to all be asking, I think, is how can we as his followers participate in Christ's mission to reach the world? And so that's where we are today. Jesus, he never said to us, go get a megaphone and stand on the street corner and try to argue people into my kingdom. He never said that. Neither did he say, hey, um, go sign up for a 13-week class on evangelism. He didn't say that. He doesn't tell people to do those kinds of things. What he does tell them, though, he tells them, go home and tell your family and friends what I've done for you. We see that again and again. And so to sum that up, we could say with uh, confidence that God's strategy to change the world can be summed up in one word, and that one word is relationship. 
That one word is relationship. Relationships are how the majority of people come to faith. And I think I can prove it. If you're here this morning and you have a relationship with Christ and you look back on your life and how you came to know Him, there's probably somebody or a group of somebodies that influenced that decision. And so as you look back on your life, how many of you would raise your hand and say, I could name at least one person, I'm not going to call on anybody, but I could name at least one or two or three people that had a very specific influence and an impact on my decision to come to follow Christ. How many of you would raise your hand and say, that's the case for me? Never fails. I'd say it's 80 to 90 percent. Uh, it's the way the world works. So the relationships form the very foundation of the way the kingdom of God is built. And 2,000 years after Christ ascended to the Father, I believe He is calling us to partner with Him by continuing what He started when He walked here on this earth. We get to tell the people that God has supernaturally and specifically placed in our lives and our spheres of influence about His grace and about His mercy and about His love. And so I want you to think about it today. Think about what that could mean for the people that you know, that you love. You remember Timothy's conversion story? It was referenced by Paul in his letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, Paul says, hey, Timothy, I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and then in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded it now lives in you also. See, Timothy's conversion story sounds a lot like yours and mine, and maybe um, you have to exchange the name grandmother or mother for another member of your family, or you might have to put in a name of a coworker or a neighbor or a classmate or a friend who influenced your life. But even so, I am convinced that most of our testimonies sound amazingly similar to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. It's the story of lives changing one relationship at a time. It's a simple strategy to reach our world for Christ. See, Jesus didn't say, go witnessing. In fact, he said we should be witnesses. And there's a difference between going witnessing and being a witness. Witnessing is not what you do, it is who you are. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the point. I mean, we all get to participate. Nobody has to be left out. And here's where it gets so practical. I want you to think about, and I actually want you to write it down, who's in your sphere of influence? Who are my present people in my relationship circles? If you have a worship folder with you, there's in the outline section, the sermon section, there's a place for you to jot down the answer, you know, write the top two or three people. Who are my, you know, some of my relatives, the first two or three that come to mind, just write them down. And even if you don't have a worship folder, I wish you would take the time to do this just on a piece of paper. And if you don't have a paper or pen, do it sometime today. But I really would encourage you to write down who are these people that you're in relationship with? Who are the people that you would say are your relatives? Who are your friends? Who are the people that are co-workers with you that you're going to interact with tomorrow? I mean, you're going to spend the next five days with them, probably the next 40, 50, 60 hours that you're going to spend with them this week, maybe working shoulder to shoulder or in the same office or riding in the same vehicle or who knows what. These are people that you're going to interact with in life. Jot those down, two or three. You could go as far as you want, but I just, I want you to have down 12 to 15 names, the, your neighbors. You, you know, that's obvious. The people that you're in school with, maybe you say, well, I'm not even in school. That'll be an easy one for you. But if you're taking some classes or a full-time student, you can write down who are the people that you're interacting with there. And then just other, just people that you live life with. Put down some names. Now, while you're doing that, I'll remind you that back in May, when we first introduced the idea that we were changing the name of the church, we handed out a window cling. I hope you're still using that. We have a, a double sink in our bathroom, and right in the middle of the sink at the top of the mirror, there's this silhouette. What's the point? It's got the picture of the individual, the silhouette of a person, and that was to represent a person that you would pray for. And, and I, chances are good that some of these folks would be represented by that individual, because when you think about what's the point, it's Christ and sharing Christ with those that we interact with in these circles that's the point of what we're about here. That's what we're trying to get you to think about. 
And so as you take a look around, these are the people that God has supernaturally and strategically placed in your life, and I believe that he wants you to influence them for him, and uh, we'll talk about that because that is, in fact, the point. These are the people you know, they're the people you're living life with. The question is, will you begin to intentionally influence them for Christ? Will you be Christ's ambassador to them? As you look at that list, and I hope you'll have it in writing, but if you don't, get it in writing sometime today. As you look at this list, as you think about these people, this is the world that God wants you to change. This is the world that God wants to change through you. I mean, think about it. In light of the names on your list, I want you to think about some powerful truths that lead to an inevitable conclusion about the priorities of the point. Just two or three things. Number one, Christ's mission is to seek and save the lost. We talked about that last week. There's no question about it. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 makes it clear. Paul said, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. So he tells us in plainly and emphatically, Christ came for a specific purpose. That purpose is to save the world. He wants to come into the world to save sinners. We talked last week to seek and to save that which is lost. This passage here is all inclusive. It includes every person in your family, all your coworkers, all your neighbors, all your friends, everybody on that list that you just made. It includes everybody you know and everybody you meet. It even, it even includes you and me. Everybody's there. Jesus came to reach the lost. That's his mission. That's why he came. But secondly, we have to admit the fact that Christ's mission is not yet complete. It's not complete. You just look around. I mean, this world that we're living in, folks, it's in a tailspin. And there's evidence all around that that's the case. People are looking for answers. And they're looking in all the wrong places in many instances. The mission is not yet, yet accomplished. And yet God is giving us a little extra time to continue his mission here on earth. Truth number three, you and I, if you're a Christ follower, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you're a believer, we have been given the mission. We have been called to continue Christ's mission here on earth. Until Christ returns, the mission of reaching the lost has to continue to be a priority in the local church. We talk about the great commission of Matthew chapter 28. It is the great co-mission. It is us partnering with God to be able to impact our world. We're the local expression of Christ to the world. We're his hands. We're his feet. We're his mouthpiece. See, these are the truths that lead to a conclusion that, that the strategies and actions to seek and save the lost, these have to be a priority in the local church. They need to be a priority in our life as believers. Really needs to be the starting and ending point of ministry in the church. See, as a dedicated Christ follower, my goal is to help connect people to Christ. You know, that's the point. As a dedicated Christ follower, my goal is to try to help connect people to Christ. He came to seek and to save the lost. That mission is not yet finished. I'm to continue what Christ started. There's my goal. There's my mission. That's the mission of the church. This is the point. Now, if you brought your Bibles along with you, I'd invite you to turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, and we're going to read together several things that Paul said to the church at Corinth, and these are statements that have an impact and an influence on our life today. Uh, we're starting at 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where he said, if anyone is in Christ, talking to the church, to Christians, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. See, as a follower of Christ, I'm a new creation. If you claim Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I hope there's a distinct difference between what was and what is in your life because Jesus Christ came to transform us. Christians are brand new people, according to the Bible, on the inside. The Spirit of God has given us new life, and we are not the same as we used to be. If you're still living the same old life the way you used to be, just calling yourself Christian, something has gone wrong. We need to sit down and talk about what Christ wants to do in and through you. Because when he comes and changes us, we are a new creation. We're not just reformed. We're not just rehabilitated. We're not just re-educated. We are recreated. Paul said we're new creations living at a daily vital union with Jesus Christ. 
And when you come to Christ, you don't just turn over a new leaf. You begin a new life. And that life is with a new master that brings us a new perspective on life. And God gives us in that process a new mission. And that mission is outlined in verse 18, 2 Corinthians 5, 18. He said, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and then gave us, look at that, the ministry of reconciliation. Because we've been reconciled to God, we have been given the privilege of encouraging others to be reconciled with him as well. Uh, that's the God-given responsibility for every Christian, I think. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting men's sins against them. And look here at this last line of verse 20, or verse 19. He has committed to us the message of recon reconciliation. He's given us that message and that mission, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, we all know what an ambassador is. If you watch any kind of politics, uh, world governments, you understand an ambassador is somebody that represents uh, one country to another. They're an official representing this country coming to represent that country to another country. That's what a, an ambassador does. Well, as believers, the Bible tells us that we are Christ's ambassadors to the world. I am Christ's ambassador to my world. You are Christ's ambassador to your world. And he's sending us to our world with this message of reconciliation. He's sending us to our world with this message of reconciliation. And it's an important responsibility that we should never take lightly. And I just want to make clear what that responsibility is. Because some of us have lived the Christian life and we've just kind of gone along. We really haven't stopped to think about it. But he's given us a responsibility. First of all, I first need to establish a personal relationship with Christ. That's foundational to all of this. Because without a relationship with Christ, I mean, I can't take anybody where I haven't gone myself. I can't be an ambassador if I've never been to a country. I can't be Christ's ambassador if I've never uh, had a relationship with him. So my encouragement to you is don't be a spectator. If you've been around the church for a long time, you've kind of stood on the sidelines, you've kind of been over in the shadows, but you've never really been a part, kind of let it be somebody else's gig, and you've kind of stood back and just said, you know, talked about their church and their mission and their thing and their classes and all of that, it's time for you to step across the line and say, you know what, I want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ myself, and I want to be able to be Christ's ambassador and help others come into that saving knowledge of Christ as well. I want to get plugged into a personal relationship with Christ. And, and I love the passage over in Romans 10, 13. It says, everybody that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've been, no matter who you are, Jesus Christ offers you this incredible gift of grace for which we thank God. But if I'm going to be Christ's ambassador, if I'm going to be a part of this mission, it has to start there. I've got to have that relationship myself. The second thing is, then I need to develop an awareness of those who don't know Jesus. And that's what we're trying to do to get you thinking about who do you know that needs Jesus right now? Is there anyone that you know that needs Jesus right now? You can just look at your list. You can just look down that list. And as you know, people, um, you're going to look at people on that list and you're going to have to be honest and say... If that person died today, I'm not trying to be their judge, but just giving, you know, evidence to what they've said themselves about themselves, I would say that if they died today, they would enter a Christless eternity. Every once in a while, I'll run on to somebody and they'll, they'll just speak that to me. And I'm quick to tell them it doesn't have to be that way. Somebody just recently said, well, if I died today, I know I'd go to hell. What a tragic way to live. It doesn't have to be that way. See, we really do believe there's an eternal place called heaven. And we really do believe there's an eternal place called hell. And we really do believe everybody's going to spend eternity in one of those two places. And we believe Jesus Christ made it possible that every man, woman, boy, and girl could have a relationship with Christ. And in having that relationship, gain entry through the grace of God to an eternal place called heaven. And, and so we want to try to do everything we can to, to reach out to those people that are destined for a Christless eternity. Do you know anybody? Do you know anybody that would benefit from knowing about the hope that is within you? 
today? Would it be meaningful for anyone you know to hear about the mercies of God that are new in your life every day? I mean, everywhere I look, everywhere I look, there's all this evidence that families and lives, individual lives are so messed up. They're lost. There's no purpose. They, they, they would love to have purpose. They want their life to have meaning and they're looking for answers. And I really do believe that Jesus Christ is the answer to the questions they're asking. And I believe many of you believe that as well. But do you believe that God might have placed you in their life, in that circle of influence, that you might be able to influence them and share with them what Christ has done for you? I mean, I really do believe that more family and individual problems could be resolved if believers would just sh step up and share the change, share the difference that Christ has made in your life, in your marriage, in your home, in your family. I mean, when it comes right down to it, you have been invited into the greatest initiative in history. You have been invited into the greatest cause in the history of the world. Jesus Christ started a mission. He, uh, he left and he said, hey, you guys, continue what I've begun. His mission to seek and to save the lost. And so the next way we can do that is by cultivating relationships. Cultivating relationships. Look for the people that God has placed in your life in some tangible ways and that you'll interact with in the days ahead. Uh, see, the longer people are in the church, the less they know people, it seems like, outside the church, they think. But that's not really the truth. All that happens is you have to learn to be intentional because you have people that you know that don't know Christ. And you have to decide, I'm going to invite my neighbors over for dessert. I'm going to get to know them. I'm going to go for walks in the neighborhood and I'm actually going to stop and talk to people that are out in the front yard working. I, I'm going to watch for the needs that I can meet around about me. I'm going to start a small group and invite some people in for a book study or I'm going to volunteer and get involved in the community or I'm going to eat lunch with a different person every day at work, a different colleague, and I'm going to get to know some people. There are hundreds of ways for you to uh, creatively cross the paths of unbelievers, many of whom are in the circles of influence that you've written down today. Then the next thing I would ask you to say, Lord, use me. Just ask the Lord to say, Lord, use me. If you'll make yourself available, I think you'll be amazed to see how God wants to use you. You might, might be surprised at just how easy it is for you to impact your world for Christ. To be able to pray for the lost and say, you know, God, here I am. I'm available. Use me. It's a dangerous prayer. Some of you need to pray it before you go to the high school tomorrow, before you step into the office, the classroom, before you step out of the house. God, here I am. I'm available. Use me. And then be willing to tell others about the hope that you have within you, what Christ has done for you. You might even be surprised how simple even an invitation to church could change the life of somebody that you know. Because they show up and there's a connection made and their life is never the same. We could have people stand all over this room and tell that same kind of story. Hundreds of hands went up just a few moments ago that tells us that somebody had an influence on my decision to follow Christ. You could be that influencer. Just say, Lord... I want you to use me. And then here, here's the key thing. Number five, point people to Christ. Point others to Christ. That's what this whole summer has been about. That's where we've been heading. This is the point. It's Jesus. The point of the church is Jesus. The point of our faith is Jesus. Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. And our desire is to point people to him. Hashtag, this is the point. That's what it's all about. It's not a play on words. It's a golden opportunity for you to tell others about the hope that is within you. In Paul's farewell address to the Ephesian elders in uh, Acts chapter 20, he summed up the point of his life. He said, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. And then he sums it up right here. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. That's his summary statement on his entire life. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. That was the point of the Apostle Paul's life. And it's the point for you and me as well. 
See, if you think you're somehow disqualified, you know, from being able to be a part of that, you have bought into Satan's lie. See, uh, people often, you know, get to the point and say, well, you know, I can't do a whole lot. You know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a bad person. I've got a bad history. You've bought the lie. Because, you know, the Apostle Paul who just made the statement, you know, I, the Lord has given me this task of testifying to the gospel of grace. He was the number one persecutor of the church until he had a dramatic encounter that turned his life a full 180 degrees in one day. He referenced himself as the chief of sinners. I don't see anybody in here that would meet that qualification. I don't see anybody in here that I would think was the number one persecutor of the church or of Christian people. And yet God did a work in the Apostle Paul, and he can do the same thing in you to where you can understand my mission in life is to testify to the gospel of God's grace, and I'm done making excuses, and I'm done copping out, and I'm done sidestepping the issue. I'm ready to say, Lord, here I am, use me, and I want to point people to you, and that's what we're trying to set you up to be able to do. I hope you're beginning to understand that, that you have a role in reaching your world for Christ. And this morning, I want us to pray that God would give us the eyes to see the spiritual needs that are all around every one of us. Because I believe he has placed you in, in uh, circles of influence, spheres of influence, where you will be able to speak truth into a situation and bring Christ into the conversation and bring Christ into the conversation. It could change everything, but you're there for a purpose and you have to think about it intentionally. That God would give us the eyes to see the spiritual needs and pray that not only when we, will we see those needs, but that we'll be willing to respond as the Lord directs us. Because here's the thing, folks, with our story, the Word of God, and our sensitivity to God's Spirit, we can develop an ability to impact our world for Christ. That's the point. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to see happen. Why, why? Why do we want to do that? To build a big church? No, it has nothing to do with the church. It has to do with the eternal souls of boys and girls and teenagers and men and women in the surrounding area. See, when we talk about changing the world, it's this magnitude of a thing that's just a little overwhelming, but when you break it down and talk about changing your world, changing my world, it becomes a little more manageable. And with God's help, listen to me, with God's help, we can do it. And that is my prayer, that God will help us continue what Christ started when he was here on this earth. He came to seek and to save the lost. That was his mission. He says, you guys keep it up there at the point in Seymour, Indiana. And I believe eternity will be impacted over what is going to happen here in the weeks and the months and the years to come. We're going to sing some more in a moment. But before we do, I want to pray with you. Would you bow your heads, please, as we pray? In uh, the Bible, we're told to pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth workers into the harvest field. We're told, lift up your heads and look around. The fields are white. They are ripe unto harvest. There's no question about that. I think most of us see that. I think most of us feel that. Most of us understand that. My question is, have you understood your part in being able to make a difference? Are you ready to talk to people when somebody says, what's the point? What's a point to life? Are you ready to point them to Jesus Christ? Are you ready to share with them the hope that is within you? Is there somebody that you'd like to pray for? A situation you'd like to pray about? Would you like to step across the line yourself and say, Lord, I, I've got to start with the basics. I've got to get my life, my own life right first. Is there somebody that, that the Lord's already been talking to you about and you just need to say, Lord, I give them to you and I'm going to go to work tomorrow with the idea that when you open the door, I don't know all the answers. My life isn't perfect, but I do believe you put me there for a reason. And I'm going to speak the truth from your word that I know. And when I don't know the answer, I'm going to look it up. I'm going to ask somebody. And I'm going to do everything I possibly can in the days to come to point people to my Savior, the one who has transformed my life, the one who has changed me from the inside out, the one who has made me a new creation. Father, thank you for coming. Thank you for putting on flesh and coming to this earth. 
Thank you for loving us. And Lord, thank you for using us. What an incredible thing to be a part of this divine connection. To help connect another human being that is in our circle of influence with the God who made them. It is a strategic partnership between mankind and our Creator. Lord, help us to be available. Help us to see the fields that are ripe. Help us to see the folks that need a Savior. And I pray that you would give us courage and wisdom to be able to step up. Say, Lord, here I am. Use me as we point a lost and dying world to the one who loved them enough to die for their sins. This is the point. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.